We're going to talk about two. We're going to talk about two things, and then, of course, if there's anything that y'all want to chat about, we'll do that. But uh, two things we're going to talk about is impact of interest rates on pre-approvals, mm -hmm. and things that you can do as the buyer's agent and as the listing agent to ensure that your client is covered, whether it's a buyer or a seller. So um, as, a, as a listing agent, I have a question for you. When you get a new contract in, how closely do you review the financing contingency other than the, um, I mean, the, the financing exhibit? How closely do you review the financing exhibit? And I know you always look at, as a, now this is a, if you're the listing agent, I know you always look at both the conti financing contingency and, a, and the appraisal contingency. Do you look at anything else on that, on that report, on that exhibit? Yeah. If so, what? What their interest rate is on the top of it, okay. the terms of their mortgage are. Okay, so you are looking at that top stuff. Yeah, I had a I had somebody submit a, an offer on one of my properties last week that had a five percent interest rate on FHA, and that's not correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, when did you happen to call the buyer's agent on it, and if so, what was their response? Uh, I did not communicate with the buyer's agent. I went straight to the lender and uh, just said, "Hey, they sent over a." a, a contingency with 5% on FHA. We're tracking much higher. Is this what you are able to offer? And okay. then I sat back and let them respond. And okay. we got it worked out. They, okay. they brought a contract back with six and a half on FHA. Okay, yeah. all right, fine. So That's you are looking at it. Bill, go ahead. No, I'm, I was just telling Casey, that was a great way to handle that, I think. Just yeah, uh, and that was gonna be one of the things, I'm glad to hear that, I and mean, thanks for bringing that up, because that's a critical piece of it. Um, I personally had a, um, one of my buyers, the contract came in last week and it showed a 5.5 5 interest rate. And I immediately called both my agent as well as the buyer and I said, guys, look, I mean, 5.5 right now is a hope and a prayer. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that. I said, you know, it's not my responsibility to say anything to the listing agent, but if it comes up, I just want you to be aware that I will have to respond to it because that's just not there right now. So, and they took care of it, I didn't have to. But as a lender, I mean, I, that's one of the things we look at and I would like to think that as a listing agent, you're looking at it. Now, let's turn it around and from a buyer's agent standpoint, like I say, one of my buyer's agents put that on there. And I was kind of like, why would they do that? So how do you determine what to put in there? When you're filling out your, your financing exhibit, what do, you, what do you put in there? How do you know what to put in there? Depends on the approval letter. Yeah. I'm sorry? Depends on the approval letter from the lender. It depends on the approval from the lender. Yeah. Okay. Most of the time, I'll, my lenders have it in there, what their rate is going to Okay. Be. What if that approval, so in other words, you base it off what, the, what they put in the approval. What if the approval was from three weeks ago? Would you do anything different or would you put that number in there? Depends on the type of loan. The FHA, conventional VA? Yeah, I might ask. I might ask the question. You might ask the question, yeah. okay. Anybody else? I, I try and make it as low as I can reasonably make it uh, from the buyer's standpoint because if the if the, I'm, I'm fighting for my buyer's ability to escape the transaction in case the interest rate comes in below that number, that's a, that's a kind of a tactic. Right, okay. All right, so you try to keep that number as low as possible and let the chips fall where they may with the listing agent and the seller. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? All right. The reason I bring that up is what we've been talking about from a listing agent standpoint. What does a listing agent do? Because if you put in that, you put in a real low number in there, what do you think your buyer's expectation is based on seeing that on that exhibit? That number. They're thinking that number. So if you put in 5.5 .5 
and the real answer is 6.375. I mean, that could, your buyer could be surprised and not real happy with. So if you're gonna use low interest rates in that number, now if you're using a rate that's a quarter below, it's not a big deal. But if you're putting an interest rate in there that's a half or three quarters or, or a point below where the market is, then please be in mind the strategy you're using to do that, I hope that you're explaining that to your buyer when you go ahead and submit the contract. Because, and you may not want to get into that discussion with your buyer because that's really up to me to have that discussion. But at the same time, I would hope you don't want to set an expectation with the buyer that just can't be met. Because that's not going to make you or me or any lender look, look happy because the buyer is going to say, what is going on? I'm expecting this, I'm getting this. Now, to Jasmine's point, I would advise you strongly, I don't care what the pre-approval letter says. I think that's a good place to start, but I think if it were me and I were writing, a, if I'm a real estate agent and I'm writing a contract today for a buyer, it only takes a moment to call or text the lender and say, the pre-approval that you gave me a couple weeks ago or last week or whatever was at 6.0. Is that still possible for this buyer on this loan? Why? Because of what I just said. We want to set at least as reasonable an expectation with our buyer, regardless of like what Casey said, regardless of the number you're going to put in there, but you want to set the reasonable expectation. So if you're going to put a number in that's below where the market is, that's fine. Be sure you're setting that up with your client so that the proper expectation has been set for them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I would strongly encourage that whenever you're writing that in the contract, make that call, especially because of the volatility of the market. So for example, Jasmine, if somebody did that three weeks ago and they were working on it on Friday and you were getting ready to submit one over the weekend, certainly whatever they put on three weeks ago is not what it was on Friday. Now here's the other interesting thing. Whatever it was on Friday, probably not gonna be that today. It's gonna to be much lower because the T-bill's dropping a lot today. So I think we're gonna see much better rates today than you would have if you would have wrote a contract on Friday. So everything is set up so that you can do something better for the client or set an expectation so they don't get real nervous about what's going on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And I, I can't emphasize it enough because we're seeing things come in. I'm seeing contracts come in where the numbers just don't add up. And then whether it's me or another lender, we get on the phone with the buyer and the buyer has a much, you know, they're not, they're, you got to soften that one, which is what we do. We make it nice and soft, nice and easy for them so that they can be okay with it. All right. Anybody else have any input on that before I go on to the next subject? Okay, next question. When you get appraisals versus property inspection, when you get a property inspection done and you write the amendment to address concerns for, the, you know, for your contract, are you referencing the, in, the specific inspection and the specific inspection item, are you referencing that in your amendment to address concerns? No. So I see no. heads going both ways. <laughs> no. All right. If you are doing it, let me ask this, why do you do it? And, if, and then Jay, I'll just ask you, if you're not doing it, why not? So Jay, let's go to you first. Okay, so you don't want the underwriter to ask a question about that item and say, let me see the inspection report. Now, they're not supposed to ask for it, but if they did, you don't want to ask them. Me? Yes. Oh, well, um, I would list everything, only the items that the buyer have a problem with. Okay, so here's, here's my two cents, all right? You only got to get burned one time before you realize, don't do that again. So years ago, 
I had a situation where I didn't look at the amendment to address concerns close enough and it was specific. It actually said item number one, inspection report item 5.20 or whatever it was, I don't know. Repair that. And they went down the list. There were only four or five items on it. And I had an underwriter, when it went into underwriting, request to see the inspection report. Needless to say, I had a cow. I said, you can't ask for the inspection report. It's none of our business. And they said, well, the, the, le the, the buyer signed and the seller signed an amendment and the agents both submitted and said, this is off the inspection report. I want to see it. I said, sorry, we're not sending it. And, you know, it had to go up to management. Management finally agreed with me and said, you don't have to send it in other than those specific items off of the report, which I thought was overkill anyway. <clears throat> and so now that had to become a part of our deal, which we still closed, but it was just a pain in the butt. So what I advise is what Jay was saying, or the way that Jay was going. You can list a men, a, a number one, a me, a number one on the amendment, and it says, whatever it says has to be done, list what it has to be done. But please, just for your benefit, your buyer's benefit, and maybe to the lender's benefit, don't put on there, off of page four on the inspection report, item number 3.02. Just don't put that in there. List the exact description of what you're gonna do. That's fine. That's the way every amendment to address concerns will be. Then you won't have as big a deal when it goes into underwriting, it'll just fine. Because in many cases, the appraiser doesn't ask for any of that. In most cases, they don't ask for any of it. There's only once in a while that an appraiser is gonna come up with something that would, might be on an inspection report. So if it, the appraiser doesn't ask for it, the appraiser says, and we looked at this a few weeks ago when I had the appraisal up on the screen and it said, as is. So the appraiser says the property appraises for this value as is in its current condition. No repairs needed. But the inspection report says you, need, you might wanna consider doing this, 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 and this. And that's fine, but we're not gonna have we're not gonna do a final inspection because it has nothing to do with our appraisal. The collateral for our loan is good the way it is. If you wanna have something done for your buyer, that's perfectly okay. Seller agrees to it. You go ahead, put it on the amendment to address concerns, just don't reference the specific report. That's my advice. Oh, you know what, um, I misunderstood your question because uh, it sounds as if you were, it sounds as if you're asking us, um, would we put the, the, the specific page and section on the amendment? Is, is, is that what you were asking? That, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. When you fill out the amendment to address concerns and you put in item number one, um, there's no G or the GFE that's in the bathroom doesn't work. If you put that in there that needs to be repaired, that's fine. What I wouldn't do is say, Go to page four, item number 3.02, and because then they might ask. So that's that's why I'd stay away from just putting in that. Casey? I, I would probably just not even make reference to inspection report Perfect. in the in the stip at all. I don't want to make any reference to the fact that there was an inspection performed on the property. Uh, leave it to the appraiser or the underwriter's imagination about how this stipulation was determined. You know, Casey, you bring up a good point. Everybody in our industry knows every home, virtually every home that gets a loan on it, has an inspection report. Everybody knows it. As a lender, we just don't want to see it. So what, exactly what you said, Casey, just don't reference it. And we already know you're going to do an inspection report. That's perfectly okay, but just don't reference it in the amendment to address concerns. Just list whatever it is you're gonna have done, just like you said, Casey. The inspection may not necessarily have a report. Uh, I've worked with clients, now this is fringe and I understand what I'm saying, but I've worked with clients before that had a father that was out of state, not licensed in the state of Georgia to be an inspector, but 
they're like, we trust our father to yes. through and tell us, and then they send me an email of what requests they want. And you're going to put board. that in there. That's perfect. That's perfect. So that's the simplest, that's the best way to go about doing it, in my opinion. Now, I want to bring up something, because this just came up this morning. I've never, honestly, Jay, Dwayne, and myself have never seen this before. Yeah. What's that? I said, yeah. Yeah, but we so just before I came in here, they catch me and they say, "Greg," and they are showing me on the on the uh, appraisal, where the appraiser says, in addition to the following items, uh, anything that shows up in the in the inspection report may have to be completed as well, something to that knowledge. And they asked me, "Have you ever seen that language?" I said, "No, I've never seen something like that." Well, then uh, Jay told me what happened. I guess the property is a townhome, and it had a serious roof leak, and it leaked all the way through all the levels of the home. The flooring is bad, um, there's lots of water, so the appraiser put in three things. Um, structural engineering inspection is required, mold remediation, and one other thing, I forget what it was. And then the appraiser said, in addition, Anything that shows up on the inspection report could be additional work that has to be completed. Now that's the part we've never seen before. But as I told them, I said, that appraiser did a fantastic job because that appraiser is protecting both the lender, which is the, their employer basically, and your buyer. Why? Because what they're saying is, all I can see is the structural engineering, the mold remediation needed in the other piece. But there's an inspector is going to do a lot more work than I'm going to be doing, and they may see things that I can't see. So whatever that is would probably have to be done as well. First time I've ever seen that, but I would commend that appraiser for protecting the buyer in that and the lender in that instance. So again, I know sometimes we get on the case, we get on. You know, inspectors, they can kill deals. Inspectors haven't been killing deals. At least not, I haven't seen it at all in a long time. They've been, it seems like they've toned, you know, let's get the protection in there. Agents are aware of what's going on, telling people, hey, don't go killing deals because of something that's stupid. Um, let's stick with the structural things or the serious mechanical things. You know, there's a hole in the wall over here, okay? A small hole where they hung a picture. That should be okay to be taken care of by you after the closing. So I hope. Um, but anyway, um, all right. Any questions on appraisals? Because overall, they've been, at least my experience has been the last month, they're coming in beautifully. What have you seen? My last one came in 5,000 under. 5,000 under? under? What was the sales price? Uh, the original sales price was 250. 250? The inspection came in at 245. Appraisal came in at 245. Yes. All right. Were you expecting that, or would, did you know it would be close, or, or were you shocked? I knew it would be close. You knew it would be close. Okay. So 245 on 250 is not terrible. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Hopefully that one got worked out. No, they end up terminating, but we're back under contract now at 245. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay. Anybody else having, what are you experiencing with appraisals right now? Both from a buyer seller standpoint, anybody? There was the one that, that we had that, uh, where we, the pool was completely destroyed. Oh yeah. And typically it would be a safety issue mm -hmm. because it was empty and the bottom of it was torn out of it. And the appraisal came back not requiring any yeah. repairs on the pool or anything yeah. like that. It was super wacky. We had built the whole deal around expecting the appraisal to come right. back with problems on the pool. And it turned out beautifully. I mean, it worked out beautifully for your buyer because you did a great job on that thing. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had, I had a condominium that the agent told me was gonna, I think I might've mentioned this a few weeks ago. Agent told me when I, we got it, um, you know, I think we're getting it at a great price, but it is a little bit older. So we'll see what happens when the appraisal comes in. Now, mind you, it's a 245 sales price, and the um, and the appraisal came in at 295, 50,000 over contract sales price. I have not seen that big of a gain. Now, I've seen 50,000 before, but never on a 250 purchase. 
I mean, that was unbelievable. So pricing appears because of all the stuff that took place for two years and the increases we've seen. So it appears that as homes are being sold now, they're being sold at reasonable prices. They're not making those big, you know, 1% or 1.5% a month jumps. They're kind of sticking. Guess what? Appraisals are coming in right where we want them, right where we want them. All right? All right, everybody, thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs>